Good morning. My name is Jen Beer and I'm, I'm a proud Dalit woman from the Western Desert region of Western Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting today, which for me is the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I recognise their continuing connection to the land and waters and thank them for protecting this beautiful land and its ecosystems. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all other First Nations people on the call today. Hello everybody and welcome to the Choose Your Own Adventure STEM Careers Day hosted by MBN and AWS. My name is Adam and I'm joining you from Amazon Web Services, AWS, and I'll be your host for today. So you may have noticed this event is called a Careers Day, but it's actually only going to run for about two hours. So for the next couple of minutes, I'll give you a quick overview of what's going to be happening and how you can interact with your presenters. And then we'll kick off with our first session. So the aim of today is to show you that there are endless pathways into science, technology, engineering and mathematics careers. Some of these paths are pretty mainstream and some of these are a little less conventional pathways into STEM careers. We have a wide range of phenomenal speakers for you. Some speakers you'll hear from uh, having many years of professional experience. Other speakers are currently studying at high school or at university. So um, by having our speakers share their stories with you and answer some of your questions, hopefully it's gonna help break down some of the misconceptions of what it's like to work in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, despite what you may have heard, working in STEM doesn't mean you have to become nocturnal, sit in a dark room with no windows, drink oversized cans of Red Bull or coffee, and stare at a computer monitor for 18 hours straight. It's also worth mentioning that online right now, we have over 60 schools and community groups joining us from around Australia. That's hundreds and hundreds of other young people from all areas and backgrounds who may also be thinking about things like big career choices, what school or uni uh, subjects that you're going to be studying or what alternative pathways can be available to get into a STEM career. Okay, so just before we kick off, it'd be great to quickly run you through the Slido app, which is the app you'll be able to use to ask some questions of the speakers. Um, you'll see on your screen now, you should have uh, some info about Slido. Some of you may have already been asked by your teachers to download the Slido app on your device, which is great. So bring that up if you already have downloaded that. If you haven't had a chance to download the app, that's fine. All you need to do is open a web browser and navigate to Slido. So that's sli.do. At the top, you're gonna to see a section saying, joining as a participant, enter code here. All you have to do is enter the code hashtag STEM careers, S-T-E-M careers. I'll just give you a moment to do that now. Now you'll see here, this is where you'll be able to access active Q&A throughout the event. So you can keep this app open and ask questions when you'd like to. Now, because there's going to be a range of different speakers, you'll have to let us know which speaker your question is directed at if you want to ask you know, something particular of a particular person. So just mention the, the person who you'd like to ask the question of. Now, it's fine to type a question and remain anonymous, but if you do ask a question, when I read it out, I'd love to be able to you know, say who, who's asking the question and which school you're from. So if you're happy to, then feel welcome to include your name and your school's name at the end of your question. Also in the app, you'll actually be able to see other people's questions and upvote them if they look really interesting to you. So we'll move through each question quite quickly. I, I may not have a chance to get to every question, but we'll try to get, uh, get through as many as possible. Also, the questions are being moderated behind the scenes, so not every question is going to appear, appear on the app. So now it's time then to move on to our first presenter. Then straight afterwards, we'll jump into our careers panel. So please welcome Debbie Taylor, who is the Chief Information Officer, the CIO at MBN. She's accountable for leading the digital transformation of MBN and ensure the successful architecture, design and delivery of all IT and first of type network equipment, as well as the operational performance of IT systems. She has more than 30 years 
of experience in the technology and telecommunications industry. So folks have the Slido app or the browser open, you can send questions through to Debbie and she's gonna kick us off with an introduction to the event and also share some of her story. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, Adam, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Adam mentioned, my name is Debbie Taylor and I'm the CIO at MBNCO. And I am absolutely thrilled to be speaking at the virtual MBN and AWS STEM careers event day today. It's so great to see so many high school students from around the country taking part in this event, which I'm really excited to be part of. One of the things that really stands out for me about today's event is that many of the speakers are not your traditional technologists. They have very diverse career backgrounds, which I think strongly reflects where we are today as an industry and where we're going in the future. I think it's fair to say that in the past, STEM was more associated with being a programmer or a scientist working in a lab, like the characters out of the Big Bang Theory. That's definitely no longer the case. The modern technologist has so many different faces. And what is strongly driving this change is the fact that so much, so much of what we do today has technology that sits behind it. I believe that more and more, this is where the future of STEM is heading. Take YouTube CEO, Susan Wojcicki as an example. It's reported that as a child, she wanted to be an artist and studied literature and history at university. In an interview with the Guardian newspaper, she was quoted as saying, I decided to take my first computer science class when I was a senior in college. My whole childhood was about arts and being creative. I just loved to make and create things. And it was really only in my senior year that I realized computers and software enabled you to make content. And I saw the creative aspect of it. I had this view beforehand that it was a very boring topic. Today, Susan is considered a giant in the technology industry, and she's an inspiration for many people. I hope that over the next two hours, we can inspire you, excite you, show you that there's more to STEM than meets the eye, and importantly, show you that there are many pathways to a career in STEM. I thought I'd start by sharing a couple stories about me and my career path to technology. And after that, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have for me, as Adam mentioned through um, Slido. One firm belief that I have applied throughout my career in education and wanted to share with you today is staying true to what you love. I guess you could say that when I was at school, there was no defined pathway to the role that I do today. So I would consider myself an accidental technologist. As you may be able to tell from my accent, I wasn't born in Australia. I was born in the States. I come from a town called Comac, it's on Long Island. It's about an hour's drive east of Manhattan, very much a typical suburban town. I grew up at a time when big hair and shoulder pads were in vogue. We had a rotary dial phone in my home and a color TV in our family room, and you had to physically get up to change the channel. The closest thing to technology back then were digital cameras and high-end calculators. Neither of my parents were very educated. My father actually didn't finish high school, and my mother did finish high school. She started a secretary of school, but never completed it. So both of my parents came from really modest means, and because of that, they worked really hard to live in a neighborhood with a good school system to give my sisters and I the best chance at making a better and easier life than they had. From a young age, my sisters, my sisters and I were encouraged to make the most of the educational opportunities we had, including a university education. I would probably describe myself as an awkward, but also curious child at school. I was somewhat introverted with a small group of friends who I still keep in touch with despite the distance. My favorite subjects were science and maths, and that remained the case all the way through my senior years in high school. What I enjoyed the most about those subjects were the logical thinking and the, prob the problem solving aspects of them, but I never really knew where those subjects were gonna take me later in life. I was one of those kids that didn't really know what I wanted to be when I left school or even what I wanted to study at university. The path I was going down was pretty different to my siblings and many of my friends who had a clear idea about they what what they wanted to do, which um, were more traditional and popular jobs back then, like counseling, teaching, or becoming a lawyer. What I didn't realize when I was at school was that I was studying subjects for jobs that hadn't been invented yet. Nor did I know that a whole new technology industry was about to be created through trailblazing companies like Apple and Microsoft. And that by the time I graduated university, computers would st start to be commonplace in offices though, of course, not the version of computers we have today. Despite not knowing what I wanted to do, I stayed true to what I loved and trusted, and I felt that the rest would follow. I read an article last year which really stuck with me and reminded me of my time in high school. 
The article by Careers with STEM asked one question, what will a job search look like in 2050? And the answer was simple, no one really knows. One popular estimate quoted by the World Economic Forum says that 65% of children entering primary school today will ultimately end up working in completely new jobs that don't exist now. Staying true to what I loved has been a philosophy I've lived and breathed throughout my education career and has led me to this role that I love so much. So if you love a particular subject, regardless of whether it's STEM related, art or history, stick with it because the rest will follow. This brings me to my next topic. Many of you may have heard this expression, don't judge a book by its cover. I would definitely put STEM in that bucket. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about STEM. One is that it's only for smart people. I'm defining smart here as book smart because I believe that everyone has something that they are smart at. It just might not be in the conventional way. Another misconception is that STEM is more of a career for men or that it's boring. Technology is much more than sitting in an office developing code, as you will see by the different speakers you'll hear today. The industry is also making strong strides to improve diversity. Though I would say as an industry, we still have more work to do to improve female representation. Personally, I think the key lies in engaging with female students from as young as primary school. And we need for both men and women to be advocates of having more female students engaged in STEM as diversity of thought ultimately leads to better results for everyone. I'd like to point out that some of the greatest champions throughout my career have been men, which I've been truly grateful for. As for being book smart, the truth is you don't need to be or to have a passion for science and maths to have a successful career in STEM. Remember, for YouTube CEO Susan Majitsky, her path to technology started with just a simple passion for art. Technology sits behind just about everything we do these days. You can apply it to whatever you love and make it better, as Susan did. The same can be said about jobs. Whether you're an architect, a real estate agent, an athlete or a beautician, technology touches everything we do. Just imagine what it will be like in terms of how we work, live, connect and study in 20 years, 10 years, or even just five years. When I first started working, there was a clear separation between the technologists and business people. My role didn't exist in its current form. It was more about the IT person working behind a computer. Today, those lines are blurring because you can't, you can't have a successful business without technology. We are seeing that more and more in the disruption of various industries like taxis with Uber or retail shops and their online presence. We're only at the start of this journey with technology and the possibilities are endless. As the CIO of MBN, I'm keen to see more young male and females ultimately taking up a career in STEM, regardless of what you choose to study in your formal education. I firmly believe that technology will underpin the future of how we live, work, and play. And the more diversity of thought and representations we have in our industry, the better the outcomes and innovations we'll have. If I can leave you with one parting message that I've managed my career by, it's this. Be fearless about your career and be curious about everything and as this will help you find your passion. So I'm now happy to take any questions. Adam, were you going to? Debbie, I think we've just got some questions coming through now. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, my other computer crashed. Would you mind reading me the questions that are coming sure, through? Sure, just give me one sec. I'll, I'll pull them up, Debbie. Hold on. I think just to kick off, the first question that's popped up here is, what is the one piece of technology that you're using right now or that excites you? Oh, um, Personally, I mean, it, as a company, um, things like artificial intelligence are really important machine learning. It's, um, it's amazing the things that you can do with machine learning that you just can't do with people. And I'll give you an example. We, um, because we have field technicians out in the field, they take pictures. Um, those pictures are sent back to MBN so we can validate what they do. And through machine learning, we can actually review um, the millions of pictures that come through and um, be able to validate and confirm what the technicians have done out in the field, which is really important for us. Personally, I love blockchain. I'm not just talking about cryptocurrency, but I love the blockchain technology. I do a lot of research on that. I'm convinced that blockchain is going to revolutionize many industries, not just the financial one. 
Great. Well, I'd, I'd love to learn what blockchain is one day because I'm still struggling to, struggling to completely understand it, but um, it's a really interesting piece of technology. So let's Happy move on. With you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So next question. Um, so here we go. If there was something in your career journey, Debbie, that you could change, what would it be? That's a really good question. And, you know, the thing is, if I change something in my career, would I end up where I am today? I don't know. So I would say probably not. But but what I would say is that, you know, I, I've made mistakes in my career. Absolutely. And I've learned from them and I've taken some really good moves in my career. And that's been great. And I would say it doesn't really matter what you do. Own own whatever it is and um, make mistakes, learn from them and continue down whatever path it is that you're really passionate about, and you'll end up at the right place for you. Great. All right, so which industry do you think is ready for disruption? Where will the next Uber or Airbnb pop up? Awesome question. It is an awesome question. If I knew that, I'd probably be building a business and <laughs> um, and, and doing that myself. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for um, things in the environmental space. I think as a as a world, we really need to think about the future that we're leaving behind. So I would I would love to see some disruption in that space that really helps us move to carbon neutral more quickly. I think it's something that the next generation are really focused on. I know my own son is very passionate about that my both actually both my sons so i would love to see something in that space but if i knew that you know i would um yeah i'd, I'd be the next jeff bezos i think that's right i'm not sure whether you got a chance to see the rocket launch last night but it was phenomenal I did. yeah amazing i think we we have one more that's come through and we'll have time to answer this one so um debbie what support have you had or where have you looked for support in your career that you'd maybe recommend to someone starting their career journey? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, use the people around you. I mean, I know it sounds a bit boring, but your parents, your parents, friends, that's always a good place to um, to get advice. One thing that someone um, someone asked me once when they were moving from being a, um, a an individual contributor to a leader in our company, and they said, could I just spend a little time with you and know what it's like to be a manager? And can you just give me some hints and, and tricks on, on how to do that in the right way? And I thought, what an awesome, firstly, what an awesome question. How, um, you know, fearless was that person to do that? And what a great idea, because that's something that I do now. I, I look at people and I think, wow, they're doing something that I think um, I'd like to do, or they did something in a really great way, or whatever it is, I'll go to them and I'll say, hey, you know, that was fantastic. Can I learn from you for that? So I think that the thing for um, me, the advice that I would give to you is don't don't worry about asking people for, for help um, or advice because people are so willing to give it. So just look at the people that you'd like to emulate and, and ask them questions. Be curious. That's great. Thanks, Debbie. Well, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for your insights and uh, your story and advice. Um, so we'll let you go, and we're going to move on to our career panel now. Great. Have fun, everyone. All right. So for our second session for today, that's obviously our career panel. I'm going to welcome Maria Sokolva, Ria, excuse me, Maria Sokolva, Ria Patel, and Jelena Lim. What we might do is have each of our panelists give a brief introduction of who you are and what you do, and then we'll hand it over to the audience to ask some questions. So please, um, folks, send through your questions through Slido. Uh, if you'd like to ask something of a particular panelist, Maria, Ria, or Jelena, please just mention their name at the start of your question so we know who to direct the question to. And then finally, uh, if you're comfortable, don't forget to add your name and your school uh, to your question too, because I'd love to be able to um, have a bit of a shout out. So for a quick introduction, let's start with Maria, then over to Ria and then Jelena. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Adam. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Maria. I'm working as a solutions architect. I'm based in Sydney. And what it means is I work with customers, mainly customers in financial sector. But prior to that, um, it's, this is actually my third industry that I'm working in. 
and before and and the third country I'm working in as well. So I've had quite a journey um, in in my career. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Maria. Ria. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ria. Uh, I'm a current Year 12 student, and um, pretty much my STEM journey began in year seven with Lego Robotics, and then in year eight, where um, me and a team of girls we mentored a bunch of primary school students with their STEM projects, and then from then onwards, in year nine, I joined my school's robotics team. A really amazing bunch of about 20 girls. Um, we had so much fun together. Uh, we participated in the first robotics challenge, which is a, a robotics competition where you get a bunch of metal, um, you build a robot about 40 to 50 kilos, which is designed to complete a particular challenge. Um, in 2018, uh, we actually won the Australian, Australian Regional and we went to compete in Houston and represented Australia there. And pretty much from then onwards, I'm a huge STEM advocate and I'm really grateful to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Ria. Over to you, Jelena. Hi everyone, my name is Jelena. I'm currently a first year student at UNSW studying chemical engineering under the co-op program. So this means that in my next year of university and as well as in my fourth year, I'm gonna be doing a couple of internships at a bunch of STEM companies. And one of them you might know, it's Arnott's. So they're the home of the Tim Tams. So that's that. And I'm also gonna be working on a few other STEM stuff in university, so next year, I'm going to be joining a team to work on creating uh, hydrogen out of battery technology. So that's a better way um, of sourcing our energy in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jolena. That, that sounds so impressive, but all I heard was Tim Tams. That, <laughs> that's amazing. All right, so let's let's kick on with some Q&A for our three panelists. What we might do is just start off with a, like a quick rapid fire question for you all. And then we'll uh, take some more questions from Slido. So uh, for each of you, what is the one piece of technology that you're using right now? Or what's something that excites you? Let's start with you, Maria. Uh, look, I love Alexa, everything about it. Um, and the most uh, important thing for me is the frictionless experience. I, I use it for set up uh, cooking timers, for example, when I cook something, for shopping list, when I open the fridge and a butter is missing. Um, my fam our family calendar is on it as well. We control the lights with it and alarms and reminders. My kids are currently doing homeschooling. So for them to know when the lunchtime is, um, we use Alexa. We just say, hey, remind me at 1230 or whatever the time is that it's lunchtime. And it just, the whole experience is frictionless. I absolutely love it. Nice. What about you, Rhea? Um... Probably some a technology that excites me is probably um, the, the way that ro robotics, the field of robotics is actually heading towards um, probably humanoid robots and particular healthcare applications. There's some really exciting things that, that are happening around there. So yeah, pretty excited to look forward to that. Awesome. Angelina, what's the piece of technology that you're using or excites you right now? I'd have to say on a more standard level, I think coding in general just makes your life so much easier. But outside of that, I'm really interested in the solar car. So UNSW actually has a design team that's building a solar car and it's actually been working so well that they went and competed in um, uh, a competition that Elon Musk held in the US. So that's really exciting to see how fast that's growing. Awesome. All right, well, let's let's kick off with some kind of um, longer form questions. Maria, if you look back at your career, is there anything that you do differently kind of on reflection? Um, I would say that, you know, it's very hard to answer this question because you never know, you know, we don't know the future and how it would have changed if you did something differently. But I'm quite happy with my choices. And fair enough, I've made so many mistakes in my life. Um, it, but when I think about it, failure is part of the learning. So this is the part that I've learned to accept throughout my life. Because when I was much younger, I was always about perfection. It has to be perfect. You know, I have to be perfect student with perfect marks. I have to be perfect employee, um, the always best player on the team or 
you know, it was all about being perfect and in, making sure that if I did the make mistake, um, it, I would never make it again. So as part of my career, I've learned to accept that, hey, failure is, is just part of the normal life. And we don't know what we don't know. And failure is the part of where, where I actually learn um, what I was missing, the information that I didn't have at the time when I made um, certain choice or certain um, decision, made a certain decision. So for me, I would say I wouldn't have changed anything. And I've made uh, pretty big bets in my life. Some of them worked out, some of them didn't. Um, one piece of advice that I was given a few years ago, and it helped me very much throughout my life, is um, when I'm facing a difficult choice. And I know there will be no going back because um, maybe just quickly <laughs> to explain that some decisions are easy to reverse and some are not. Like some, some decisions doesn't really matter. Um, you can easily go back if you made the wrong decision. But when, you, when I'm facing a decision that is not easily reversible, um, this is what I do. This is the exercise I'm going through mentally in my head, which I was taught a while back. I imagine myself sitting on the porch being, let's say, 80 years old, looking at the sunset or the sunrise or whatever it, it is, and thinking back about my life. And I imagine myself thinking about me today, trying to make that decision. And if I regret not taking that decision or not trying something more than I regret trying and failing, then I'll go for it. Because at, at least I will know I'll, I gave it my best and look, it didn't work out. Because maybe I will never have an opportunity to try it again. So I became more and more okay with the failure over time because what if it doesn't fail? Mm. You know, imagine all the wonderful things that could have been done, you know, could have done. And I didn't maybe take that when, if I didn't take that chance. So, um, so I would say, going back to your question, Adam, I don't think I would have changed anything. It made me who I am today. And while I'm not perfect, um, I'm happy with, you know, quite a few things that I've done over in my life. Yeah, I agree, As, especially since um, our audience here is quite young. When you're young, you're still deciding what you want to be when you're older. So I think even if you're scared about an opportunity, just, just saying yes and just exploring because you're still un understanding who you are and what you like. So if you just say yes to all the different opportunities, you can cancel out the ones you don't like and really pinpoint what you do love. Agreed. Totally, Juliana. Thank you. Let's head over to Ria. Ria, a question's come through for you. So what's the, the question or the topic or the myth about STEM that you're most tired of hearing or you've kind of found to be incorrect? Um, I think uh, I've seen, I've heard a lot of people say that in order to succeed in STEM, in order to do well in it or just to pursue STEM as a whole, you must be a natural at maths and science. Um, the amount of times I've heard that. And I think that's, I found that to be really incorrect because um, over my journey, I realized that the only thing you really need to pursue STEM is passion. Um, of course, you need to put in a lot of hard work, um, you need to be dedicated, but passion is to the core of everything. Uh, the day I actually realized that um, writing code, um, seeing it come through, making a robot work, you know, getting your hands dirty, um, putting things together is something that I really enjoy and I found that to be my passion. I actually started to notice all the opportunities that were coming my way and pretty much took those opportunities. I think passion and opportunities go really hand in hand. Um, at my school uh, with our robotics team, um, with all the, all the wonderful girls and mentors that I worked with, all of them had one thing in common and I think it was passion. Uh, none of us were like, you know, gifted naturals or anything. We all just had that passion to want to build something to try and get somewhere. And to the core of everything, um, if you really 
are interested in STEM, if I think just three things, if you're interested in STEM, you have the ability to take the initiative and you just are inquisitive. Um, and that's all it takes for STEM. It's not really about whether you're a natural at maths and sciences or you're just putting in tons and tons of hard work, you know, doing a calculus, anything. Honestly, it's none of that. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunities that have come my way because of uh, because of you know this whole surge of science and technology that's been happening around us, there's a lot of importance given to it. But in my opinion, if you um, are missing the most core part of um, science and technology, which is passion, I don't think you're going to get the whole overall enjoyment out of it. So probably the, the myth to debunk would be um, it's not whether you're a natural, not about hard work. It is sort of, but not really. Um, it's all about the passion, just the passion. Nice, thank you. I could definitely hear the passion kind of coming through as well as you're speaking, so that's great. Uh, Julina, question for you. So what support have you had or where have you kind of looked for support in your career? And, um, and like, how, how, what would you recommend to someone else who's kind of starting their career journey? Mm, I think starting young when you still you're still figuring out what kind of professional field you want to enter a big part of your development isn't in your career but just who you are as a person so looking for mentors people that can guide you into um, being a better person or being a bit more of a professional um, I found that in my school we had access to ABCN and their programs and their mentorship programs really helped me figure out how to present myself and how to communicate a lot better. And then when, when you learn all of that, you can apply that into any industry that you go in. But in terms of more practical advice, anyone that's interested in sort of STEM, I would recommend having a look at a website called code.org. It's just to help you build a little bit more coding skills. And if you're looking at some more experience as well, while you're still in high school, there are a bunch of universities that offer STEM summer schools, as well as some internships as well. So just search that up online and get your hands dirty and figure out which ones you're eligible for. Great. All right, Maria, let's come back to you. Uh, your question is, what is a lesson that you have learned in relation to making uh, learning or career or life choices? Um, there are so many, to, to be honest. Um, one that I think I use more often than not is, um, again, about the choice. How do you make the choice and what do you fill your life with in your day? Um, there are um, so many things that are coming at you, you know, these days. It's very hard to choose. Do you, do you focus on your work do you, or in your career? Do you spend time with your friends? Um, if you have family, maybe you should spend some time with them. Um, and at the end of the day, how do you feel happy? Um, that's one of the things I've actually been working on for quite some time. How do I um, become or be happy? What, what is happiness to me? Um, and so that's another thing that um, I've been um, taught as a lesson. And some of you might have heard about it. It's the concept of um, a jar and what you can fit into the jar. There are only so many things you can fit in the, the jar. And um, it, they could be rocks and they could be small pebbles. And there's a lot of sand that could potentially fit into the jar. But when you think about your life, these are the um, big rocks is what really matters to you, right? Um, these are the things that will, uh, when you accomplish, they're not probably easy to do, but when you've done them, you feel really good about achieving those. So these are the big, big rocks. And it could be something to do with your work. Again, it's your pr priorities or with your friends or with your studies. Um, Pebbles is everyday things. They are important, but not necessarily what will um, make you happy. And sand is everyday things, you know, grocery shopping, talking on the phone, watching TV, things like that. And so the, um, the, um, the lesson I've been taught that if, if I fill the jar with sand first, like watching TV and spending time on things that don't matter, I will never be able to fit any big rocks in there. You know, maybe I'll be able to fit in some pebbles, but that's it. Um, so that's why it's super important to, um, when you think about, you know, 
being happy or building your career on making the choices is go for the big rocks first. And every day think about, is it some, is, am I working on the big rock or am I working on something that doesn't really matter? Am I worrying about something that's on the Instagram or in the news that potentially I can't do nothing about, right? So this is what, um, how I've structured my life um, a lot is when I go for the big rocks first. In fact, when I'm talking about the sand, I hardly ever watch any news or listen to them or listen to the radio. I don't because a lot of the time it's a collection of negative news um, and I can't do anything about that. Um, I can't even help or fix that, those situations. But people around me, my friends, my colleagues, my family, um, they are that matters to me the most. So I focus on them first. And so that, that is the lesson that I've been taught, that go for the things that matter to you the most and not worry about what somebody else thinks on, I don't know, internet or somewhere about things that none of your concerns. It will help you, know, you go through, through your life and be happy and be confident. That's a long-winded question, Adam. <laughs> That was great. Answer, I, love the, yeah. I love the analogy about the jar and I've been binging all the Netflix lately. So I think my jar is full of sand at the moment. I'll need to, <laughs> <laughs> need to review things. Thanks for that. Okay. So there's lots of questions coming through for Ria and they're around robotics and coding. Folks also just remember you can actually just upvote other people's questions through the app or the browser too. So if you see some good ones there, just click and upvote. Um, Ria, here's one for you. So when doing STEM throughout high school, did you face any major problems or challenges? Um, well, I think sort of what Maria said that, you know, you're going to have problems all the time. Challenges are always going to be there. But I think in high school, one of the biggest challenges is really um, prioritizing what you want to choose. But in this case, your choice comes between um, uh, whether you want to pursue your extracurricular, which is robotics, was robotics for me, or whether you want to do the, you know, more, the more conventional things, the um, the studying, the making notes, the, you know, reading stuff or the actual conventional studying. But um, that was one of the biggest issues. And I saw my teammates around me, they, a lot of them did really struggle in trying to find that balance. But the way I actually approached it was, you know, kind of sneaky, but um, do what I love to do. And honestly, I loved to, you know, solve that problem. But in this case, this problem was, you know, working with robots, um, trying to uh, write a code, deploy it, and trying to make that code work or trying to, you know, um, design something and trying to fix that problem in that sense. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that whether you're going to prioritize going, you know, going in the doing your homework every day. Of course, I mean, you have to do your homework, but it also comes to the fact of procrastination. When you have limited time to do something uh, about like, you know, instead of 12 hours to do an assignment, you have around three hours. I have found that um, I have much more productive when my day is structured, when it is more scheduled. So I would have like, you know, a certain amount of hours for robotics and I spend a lot of time just doing robotics. And then the leftover time, I think I was much more productive because I would know um, where I want to invest that time and, you know, what I want to do with it. So the main lesson would be that, you know, just do what you like to do, but also don't forget what you need to do. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Very I true. Think, I think when you take on an extra passion as well, if, if you're not doing sort of any extracurriculars, it's study or free time. I think, I think Ria might agree with this. When you're taking on extra robotics, it would be study, robotics, and a lot less free time. So you've got to pick and choose what you want to invest your time into. Absolutely right. Hey, uh, Julina, there's uh, a few questions coming through about University of New South Wales, UNSW. Mm -hmm. I'll, I might combine a couple together if that's okay. So, uh, you know, what is basically, what is STEM like at Uni of New South Wales? And um, what was your process for getting a co-op scholarship? And have you got any advice for future applicants? 
Yeah, so first part of the question, what's STEM like at university? There is a lot of teamwork. <laughs> so my first term at UNSW, they have a course called ENG 1000. And if you're studying engineering at UNSW, you will do that course. And it's a project-based course. So there is no, um, there's no lectures every single week. There are scheduled lectures to give you the content that you need, but you'll be in the labs, you'll be touching all the materials and you'll be building everything by yourself. And it's not the lecturers that will be sort of giving you instructions. You'll have um, university students that are sort of casual academics that will guide you through. You also have another project-based course in the second year of your engineering course as well. But between everything there, you will have a bunch of little um, assignments and little projects that are team-based. UNSW in particular, they're really big on their project-based learning because engineering is all that, and I'm sure everyone here would agree, it's very hands-on. So like I said, um, they have a program called the Challenge Program, and it's an entire, um, one year you work on a project. So the one I was talking about earlier was hydrogen energy production. And in terms of applying for co-op, I would say be very active with your careers advisors. That's how I got through with my application as well, getting a lot of feedback because it, it has to do with how you present yourself as well. We need to be representing ourselves confidently as well as just being yourself in the application. They will know if you're sort of bluffing your answers and they want someone that's a genuine fit and you wanna be a genuine fit for the co-op program as well. Nice. And just thinking if, um... The audience doesn't have access to kind of a careers advisor or something hands on there. Can you kind of apply for programs or scholarships directly at the kind of unis and institutions themselves? Yeah, yeah, you can. So you don't apply through the careers advisor, but I meant communicate with your teachers and so forth on how you can uh, select the experiences that you have. So they really enhance who you are as a person, as well as your wording as well. But you gotcha. do put in the application by yourself. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for that. Hopefully it's going to inspire some, some people here to get, get on with those applications mm. for those scholarships. So um, Maria, coming back to you, this is, this is a good question because it's really relevant. It's around COVID. Um, so COVID has changed the technology game as we know. Uh, Maria, what's the biggest leap forward you've seen in the past 18 months? Um, well, given that I work for AWS, um, I guess my response will be based on the um, on the, the work that I do with AWS, right? Um, the biggest leap I've seen uh, in technology is remote working, you know, working from home. How we suddenly had to um, stop working, go into the office and start working remotely. Video con conferencing, like this is what we're using right now, um, it's become became norm. Um, our online shopping is so much better than it was, let's say, a year and a half ago. Um, a lot of things been forced from the, you know, they would have taken years probably if not for COVID. We would have got there with remote uh, working and conferencing and online shopping, but we made it so much faster because of the COVID, because this was the only ch um, choice. And I've seen so many um, businesses in my area picking up on, um, you know, delivery of food or delivery of uh, products, um, exchanges, refunds, um, even airlines. Um, I had tickets to Melbourne twice being refunded with literally two clicks of a button. How amazing that, that, that is. So this is the change that I've seen. I feel that even though the forcing function was a negative one, right? It was COVID and a lot of people were very sick. Um, the, the result or the change in the technology is actually a positive one. Okay, thanks for that, Maria. We've just got a few moments left. Um, so I'm going to ask this one of Ria. This is around robotics. Uh, I'm in grade seven, learning robotics and coding for three years, EV3, Java, Python. Uh, Ria, can you suggest any pathways or institutes where I can have a better pathway? 
Oh, nice. Um, actually, I did EV3s. EV3s is pretty much the, the software that does the Lego robotics. Um, it's a great way to start. What you're doing there sounds like a great step towards the actual journey. Um, you might take a look at the organization first. Um, first Robotics, if you just do a quick Google search, it's an, it's an American organization which runs uh, competitions throughout a lot of different places. Of course, because of COVID, all of that has slowed down. But what you can do is um, universities near your area. Uh, you should try and um, search up universities that run those programs. For example, I know um, there's definitely university teams. Um, UNSW has one, Macquarie Uni has one, um, UCID has one, University of Wollongong. I'm not too sure, but there's so many that actually do the first program. And this first program is actually for high schoolers. Um, it's from ages 13 to 18. So these universities are working towards providing these opportunities for high schoolers in particular. So I think if you Google first, and I don't know, um, it's just, it's, it's actually an acronym. I think it's for the inspiration and recognition of science and technology. Yeah, that's, that's right. And yeah, and the main thing I would say is opportunities. Like I'm really grateful for the opportunities that I have received, but I wouldn't have received those opportunities if, I mean, of course, if they weren't there in the first place, but if I didn't take the initiative to actually um, go look for them and as well as, you know, embrace them, you really have to embrace whatever opportunities they come in your way, even if it is something that it's just slightly related to STEM. It could be, um, you know, you're going to mentor uh, a primary school student with their project. That is a step forward. And I think that's the most important thing out there. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right, well, look, we are coming to the back end of the careers panel. Thanks so much for everyone who's uh, sent some questions through. They've been great. We might finish off with a, another kind of closing rapid fire question for everyone on the panel. Um, so let's start with Jelena. Jelena, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to our audience as they start to make decisions around kind of school subject choices or higher ed choices or even their career choices? Yeah, sure. So I would say choose subjects that you even think might have any sort of similarity to your career. So even if you have any idea that you want to do biomedicine, you would choose more biology or physics space. But if you're looking at things like mechanical engineering, where it's really robotic, you might want to do engineering studies in your school as well. But I think just remember, the STEM field is rapidly changing. So your skills would be rapidly changing as well, which means you need to be able to adapt. So even if you don't pick those subjects in school, you will definitely still have what it takes to get into STEM. Awesome. Maria, any advice from you? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I absolutely agree with, with what Jelena said. Um, and the, at AWS, we actually have one of the leadership principles. It's, um, it's um, learn and be curious. And there are two parts to it, you know, be curious, asking questions and exploring new things and learning those things, because sometimes you have people who are forced to learn, but then left on their own, they're not actually going to be interested in, in any in uh, learning new things. So the, I, I would totally, uh, you know, plus one, plus hundred uh, for jo Jolena's answer. Be curious, things will change. No one's going to know what you know, your job will look like in 20 years. And I'm a living example of that. I would have never, yeah, I would have never thought that I would be living in Australia and working for AWS. Um, no way of predicting. And my job changing um, all the time. Um, the piece of advice I would give um, is probably for all the females on, on call. When I started my career, and sorry, even before I started my career, when I was in university studying computer science, I was the only girl in the whole year. Um, when I had my first job, I was the only girl on the team. And all throughout my career, because I was in a technology in IT, um, m most of the jobs I had, I was always the only one. And it felt like it was okay because I didn't know any better. I've never seen other women on, on the teams. So now I work for AWS with lots and lots of brilliant women. And what I actually had to learn is to be supportive of women. I never knew what it would be like, how I could help other fe fellow females with their career, with their advice, with anything. 
So, and I think it's something that we all need to work on um, and support each other. Um, because this is not an easy, um, you know, an easy thing if you're on your own and you're not getting support from your fellow women. If ma males are the only ones supporting you, like why, how is this fair? How is this right? So I would say be kind to each other and support each other because at the end, um, it will be better for all of us. Yep, really powerful message there. All right, look, Ria, just really quickly, do you have a little bit of advice that you could share for our audience who've got these potentially big choices in front of them? Yep, uh, just to quickly sum up what, um, you know, Maria Angelina said, I think the most important thing um, is take the opportunities that come your way, you know, that's what I did. I took whatever opportunities that came my way, embrace them, put your 100% in them, and just find that passion. Whatever STEM is such a huge world, find that tiny bit of passion that um, you, it's inside you, you just need to go out there, search for it, you know, find that one thing you like about STEM and put your all to it. So opportunities, take them and then find your passion that's it awesome thanks Ria <clears throat> excuse me and thank you to everyone on the career panel thanks Maria thanks Ria thanks Jolina uh, it was really phenomenal hearing from all three of you um, and I think everyone listening in and, and joining us we've got some some really good insights there so folks that brings us to the end of the careers panel we'll shortly move on to the second half of the choose your own adventure stem careers day hosted by MBN and AWS We'll just take a short break now, just a few minutes, uh, and then come straight back and please join us for our B Sessions segment. See you soon.
Welcome back, folks. Thanks for joining the Choose Your Own Adventure STEM Careers Day hosted by NBN and AWS. So far, we've heard from Debbie Taylor, the CIO of NBN, before holding our career panel with Maria, uh, Ria, and Jelena. So up next, what we're going to do is have our uh, what, we're gonna, what we've called our B sessions. So these are kind of four short sessions, four different speakers for you, and each of the speakers are going to share some of their story and ideas around specific themes uh, and kind of the aim is to inform and inspire you around careers in STEM. So once again, continue using Slido to ask your questions and I'll try and ask as many questions as I can of our four speakers once they've had a chance to share some of their story. So the theme for our first session is be authentic. Natalie Field is joining us and she's the Chief Technology Officer, the CTO at Belong. Natalie is a strategic change agent, leader and developer of high performance teams and individuals She's currently directing her energy to create lean, adaptive ways of working that foster creativity and innovation to increase the impact of existing business models and unlock new frontiers in the telecommunications industry. Uh, interestingly for Natalie, she also fits in being a yoga teacher into her schedule. Over to you, Natalie. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so I guess... Um, you know, Adam talked about me being a, <clears throat> a CTO and I can just make sure I get all of the technology right. And for me, you know, my mum thinks that um, I, she just tells all her friends that I'm an engineer and my son tells people that I keep the internet safe. Um, and my friends all just say that I work in technology. So, you know, CTO, it, like it's a really interesting title, but it doesn't actually represent what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I report into the CEO of Belong and I have about 200 people that report into me. On any given day, I could be um, working on how to make a great place to work. I could be teaching a yoga class. I could be starting a session with a meditation. Um, I'm also helping a team actually use technology to connect people to the internet um, and, you know, looking at data, it's very, very broad. Um, and one of the things I love to do is find ways to make my team laugh. So I'm here today to kind of share my story with you of what a career in technology actually looks like because technology has become this thing. Um, and I'm sure that all of you are using technology in your day, every day in some way, um, and you'll have various classes that focus on STEM or STEAM. But if I'm honest, um, when I was learning to code at school and uni, I found it pretty boring. Um, but I was really lucky that I accidentally landed in a career in technology and I got to experience what that really means rather than what I thought it meant. So technology actually offers such an exciting way to solve problems. And it's becoming such a core skill in any career, regardless of what you do or even what you study. And what I feel super excited about is how we can use technology um, beyond, you know, the basics of creating an app or a website. It's actually um, the way in which we can use technology to save coral reefs or find new coral reefs. It's about how we could make and design smart clothes. It's about um, eliminating weeds and accelerating reforestation um, or creating scalable energy storage and but as I said it's not the way that I always understood what a career in technology would actually mean so when I was 17 um, I grew up on a you know I didn't dream of being a CTO and I certainly didn't dream of having a career in technology um, and I actually really had no idea that it existed so I grew up on a dairy farm in northern Victoria and my dad said to me um, get into computers because they're the future <clears throat> And so I ended up studying electrical and computer systems engineering and, um, you know, just basically, I guess my dad had said girls can't be engineers and I thought I would prove him wrong. So even though he said I should get in computers, he, he said girls can't be engineers. So I basically had a plan to prove him wrong. But after all that study, I just thought I didn't want to have a career in technology and I wanted to, you know, travel the world and have an exciting life um, and I thought I would um, join a consulting firm to be able to do all that 
But surprise, surprise, the first project I got was as a telecommunications engineer. And so that was about redesigning a net, like the whole system of boxes and cables that connects Australia to the internet. And it gave me an actual taste of what a career in technology would be and um, how it can be used to solve really interesting problems and work with people. And so since then, my career has been anything but linear. There have been lots of ups and downs. And through all of that, I have stayed true to my values and what I love. Um, and I feel that, I guess, by being who I am, um, it's, I guess I've been on a really great positive trend upwards in my career and how I feel and how I show up at work. And I think it's all of these um, experiences so far have given me the confidence in who I am and how I show up and what I'm capable. So I wanted to share with you the key things that I've learned um, over my nearly 20 year career. So um, these are a series of maxims, kind of truths, if you like, that I've come across in my career. So the first one is about forge your own path. So as I mentioned, your career and your, what it looks like for you is going to be so different to mine. And the reality is, is that what you're going to be doing in 20 years actually probably doesn't exist yet, right? And so I think all of us getting away from having this idea that the first job you have is going to be anything like the last job you have or that what you study is a is a determination of what you what your career will look like we have to let go of that and so the key thing really is to just be who you are um, notice when um, be present I guess with yourself and notice what you really love doing right and take the opportunities that come up for you um, notice when you're kind of in flow and you lose track of time and aim to do more of that type of work because that will keep opening up new opportunities to do new work and the, doing the things that you genuinely get joy from. <clears throat> and I think what's really important to understand is that actually no matter what your career, right, no matter how much technology we use, the reality is, is that the magic comes from people, right? It's about what we feel joy doing. It's about how we connect with others. And it's about having that motivation and commitment to solve a problem. And so if you can appreciate that about yourself and others, all the good stuff will follow. The second maxim is about embracing your talents so that you can turn those into superpowers. You know, we all have different ways that we look at the world. We have these natural ways um, that we look at the world that is different to others. And if we think about turning those talents, we invest time in turning those talents into superpower, like into um, strengths, they can be our superpowers, right? And talents are the naturally reoccurring patterns of thought or feeling and behaviour. And, you know, it can it can be kind of easy and there's different ways for us to work out what those real talents are, but it really takes commitment to turn them into strengths. And so when you do this, when you use your strength every day, what you're best at doing, that gives you the, the uniqueness of who you are and, and the work that you're doing, um, I guess, is unique. And so, you know, for me, a good example that maybe some of you might relate um, to is that when I was young, I was really good at thinking about the future. In, I think, about 1992, I designed a house with solar pa panels on it. And, you know, I was always coming up with different ways of what the future would look like and I'd get really excited about designing a better house or a better garden or a better life, which probably at the time sometimes drove a little pe a few, my parents, I think, a little bit crazy. But what um, I realised is that that, way to think about the future actually shows up as one of my superpowers throughout my career. So, you know, I get to um, pull people together every day to think about what the future looks like in our work, in our industry. I get to energise other, others. I get to brainstorm new ways of thinking and reimagining the future of work. So as I continue to invest, you know, turning those talents um, into superpowers, I encourage you to kind of think about what are your what are your talents? The next maxim is about finding your motivation, but also know that it will change. You know, early in my career and probably when I thought about what I do in my career, I, my genuine motivation was to have a Porsche and to prove my dad wrong um, that girls can actually be engineers. But when, you know, my, my father died in 2010, 
I realised I still didn't have a Porsche and my dad wasn't around to prove wrong anymore. So I didn't know why I was doing things and I kind of lost that motivation. And I think um, taking the time to think about why I was doing things, what, what gave me motivation was a really important way for me to find the energy to, to do more and greater things. And for me, um, it took me quite a long time to work that out. And in, you know, 2014, I kind of realised that um, actually this mindset of we're not enough, um, we, we must be more, probably wasn't the right one. Actually, what happens if we think we are enough? And how about we focus on that with everyone we work on and including ourselves? <clears throat> and then a little bit later, I was very lucky to have my beautiful son and he gave me another level of motivation because I realised I wanted to create a really great future for him and his friends and, and, and others. Um, and that, I guess, now I'm working at a wonderful place that allows me to do really creative thinking um, and work with, with teams to solve problems in a new way. But knowing why I get out of bed is what gives me the opportunity to put 200% into what I do and the impact that I have. And for me, I guess my mission is about creating, um, you know, creative, innovative workplaces that create energy for people. The fourth one, Maxim, is really about your work is you. So I think what's really important to understand is your personal brand shows up in every task that you do, regardless of the task, right? We're going to have jobs that we hate and jobs that we want to procrastinate on and jobs that we love. Um, but know that every task you take on gives um, others an insight into who you are. And it also creates trust in others to give you more opportunities that are, expand on your potential. So I think, you know, just a little story to share with you is that um, for me, you know, in, in 2005, early in my consulting career, I was given this job that many would think was pretty boring. I had to pull together one document, or like from different engineer, eight different engineers, pull it all together in one document and format um, that document. Sounds pretty boring and I felt like spending four and a half years at university um, to pull together one document wasn't that exciting. But what I did was approach that in a way that was really disciplined, really brought people together, clear communication, and what's really interesting is that gave me um, more opportunities to do more things. And actually, the way in which I approach that is exactly how I approach my job today. So I think really something for you to think about is for every opportunity you get, no matter how small, do the best with your capability and potential, because that um, starts to show people who you are and what opportunities they can give you and create that trust. The fifth one is you win or you learn. Um, and I think this is a really important one because um, I think often we can feel like if we don't win, we're failing. And the important, I guess, opportunity here is to rather than apply um, the mindset of uh, perfection and extraordinary detail, and that, that was the way I guess I approached everything through school and, and university. But in a work context, when I didn't know how to do something, I, initially I would see that it was failing. And one of my first jobs was I was asked to write a new strategy for a, uh, the satellite system that goes above Australia. And I had no idea what I was doing and I felt like that was failure, but actually my manager helped me to embrace that as learning and, you know, it helped me to get back up and apply that learning to everything that I'm doing. So even when it feels really hard and you're in that learning pit, embrace that as a great opportunity. The sixth one is you will need to juggle. Some balls are going to break and some um, are going to bounce. So as we go through life, um, really understanding, like there are so, you know, so many things that we juggle and about seven years into my career, I was having a great time training for a marathon, traveling all over Europe, you know, had a new boyfriend and, um, you know, I'd be running in the snow for this training of the marathon, but I was feeling tired and run down and I was completely ignoring that working lots of hours. But when I came back to Australia, um, after I'd, you know, been on this great trip to um, Munich to go to the 
Oktoberfest, I went back to Australia and my GP put me straight into hospital because um, I was extremely unwell and he gave me the verdict of um, having an autoimmune condition which had been brought about by complete fatigue. And so I think it's, you know, it's taken me seven years to bounce, took me seven years to bounce back from that. And, you know, there's always going to be things in our life that feel like they're coming at us. And it's really important to understand what things, if you drop them, are going to break like, um, yeah, like your health, I suppose. So really focus on that. And then the last thing is to be yourself because everyone else has taken we all, you know, draw inspiration from others because we're human and we compare and contrast. But I think it's really important for us to understand that instead of focusing on what all the other people are and what you're not, um, focus on all the things you are and making that amazing. And in 2017, I was asked to take on this new senior role of leading people. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about all the things I'm not that I needed to work on but it took a real light bulb moment to think about, actually, what if I just focus on what I am and what I can offer? So rather than constantly trying to be what others are, just be the absolute best version of me. And when you do that, that creates confidence in yourself and you shine and other people are going to be drawn to your authentic self. And in terms of what's next, I'm sure Adam's going to ask me some questions. Um, but the things that you can do, I guess, is really about getting curious, um, getting curious about um, what sort of things um, you love, what fills your cup, what are the problems you want to solve, um, what you love doing and when you're in flow, and what, um, what problems in the world you want to solve and how technology might help you with that. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Natalie. I loved hearing about your maxims. Really, really powerful. We've got a bunch of questions coming through and we probably have time for one. <clears throat> Excuse me. This one was, was really interesting. We have lots of schools joining us who are regional schools. You mentioned kind of growing up in the bush. So um, yeah. if you are you know, living in a regional town, how do you get into a career in STEM? Is that kind of a, an inhibitor to you getting into a career in STEM? I mean, I don't think so. I... I I guess and any any person who's in regional and wants to reach out to me on LinkedIn, please do, because I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to use technology. Like a lot of my friends who are still on farms in regional Victoria, like they are using technology for amazing things, right, in terms of better productivity, create, like they're creating new feeders for um, sheep and they, you know, that means that we're much, the sheep are healthier and it's much more efficient. So I think it's just about um, there is so much available online to learn um, and I don't think, yeah, I don't see any inhibitor and I just think there's so many opportunities, but I, I think that's a long conversation. Everyone's going to have different um, situations, I guess, but please reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm very happy to do everything I can to help you. Nice. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, thanks for sharing your story and we'll move on to our next session now. So our second session has the theme of be creative. And with us is Tiffany Okewale. Now, Tiffany is a senior software and systems engineering major at MBN, uh, driving and enabling continuous improvement in MBN's engineering delivery and practices. Uh, and with her team uh, of diverse and, and geographically dispersed top engineering talent, uh, Tiffany speaks five languages. She's lived in five countries and she's traveled to 30 countries. Over to you, Tiffany. Thank you, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Just checking my uh, my sound. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Tiffany. I'm a systems engineer manager at MBN, and I'm honored to be sharing my background, education, and career path with you today. So a brief brief background about me is I am Nigerian and Australian. And my country of origin, Nigeria, is situated in West Africa. Nigeria is a very beautiful country and it's the largest economy in Africa. We speak English as an official language, as well as three other national languages, Yoruba, Hausa, and Igbo. 
It's a beautiful country, so I recommend you visit at some point. I grew up speaking three languages, English, Yoruba, and Hausa. And I picked up three other languages when I moved abroad, French, Spanish, and German. I'm a bit rusty in German these days, so I put cross across it. Um, I've lived in five countries, like Adam mentioned, Nigeria, France, USA, Australia, and the UK. And a bit about my education. So I attended one of my mom's two schools. My mom um, attained degrees in math and education and taught for 16 years, after which she built her and ran her two schools for about 25 years. The first school ran the British curriculum and had about a thousand kids. The second um, school ran the American curriculum and had about 700 kids. Um, and then she sold both schools right now and she's retired traveling around the world, seeing her kids and grandkids. So my start to STEM and how I got to be introduced to STEM and how I got to love the STEM field was um, when my mom purchased several computers on a trip to the US and she brought it back to Nigeria to her schools. So the computer came with a book that had code in it. At the time, I guess I didn't really know what code was all about, but I knew that if I typed in all this code, I would get this animated display and it was amazing. And that is how I got my start in STEM. I just fell in love with computers and I wanted to know more. And then in high school, I opted to take, to take a couple of coding classes as well, um, just writing different commands in the command line prompts you see there, searching for files within the computer, launching programs, and so forth. And I took that love over to, um, to my university and to France as well. So in between high school and university, I decided to go learn French. I moved to Lyon to start. Um, I took up French in the Alliance Française in Lyon, got an advanced certificate in French. Um, at that point, I traveled extensively around Europe um, as a student. There's lots of cool student discounts I got to travel around, so I took advantage of it. Um, and then um, when, I, when I was done studying French and, and French and traveling a bit, I started my foundation year in computer science at the American University of Paris. Um, my major was in computer programming, but I took other exciting electives such as social psychology, philosophy, critical thinking, English literature, as well as math. Um, so it was really a great experience. And at the American University of Paris, I continued to learn how to program. And I wrote some pretty cool programs, one of which was a music playlist application and the other one was a restaurant ordering billing system. Um, and then um, I went to go join my brother in the UK and finished my, my uh, degree in the UK. I still majored in computer programming, but took on a wide range of computer science subjects at the time in further math, developing databases, further uh, website development, networking, image and sound editing, video production. And because of my love for um, languages, I picked up Spanish and German as well and got certified in those as well, in addition to my degree. Um, and then after graduation, I decided to take up the uh, post-study work visa opportunity that I had to get some work experience. And I, was, I predominantly was in, in Wales, Cardiff to work, but I spent some time in London as well as my family was there. So while working in the UK, I started out with an asbestos management services company that was predominantly paper paper-based, and they wanted to get fully automated in their operations. So I put on my business analyst hat and um, went around the, um, the organization, took down requirements, interviewed all the stakeholders, got the technical requirements, non-technical requirements, after which I visualized these requirements into wireframes to actually show the client what it would look like when the application is done. And on the back end as well, I got to design the database on the back end side of things, relational databases. And so when once I got those approved, I now, I now brought those wireframes to life using these applications here, as well as uh, brought the database to life as well, designed the tables, connected the database to the front end, and also recommended a reporting software, which I integrated with the database so we can make meaningful reports for the clients. So that was my first job out of uni. And then after that, still in the UK, I joined some other for firms um, that catered to telecommunications companies and real estate agencies. But with these jobs, I got to work as part of a team, a team of other software developers. And I was usually the, the only lady on the team, which was um, 
which I, I, I sometimes wished I had a, a, a few more ladies to, to relate with, but nevertheless, I learned a lot. I learned a lot working as a team of software developers, but um, it would have been nice to have a few more um, ladies on the team with me. And then after my, um, after my work, post-study work visa um, got to a close, I moved back to my country, Nigeria. And in Nigeria, I took on really amazing pro uh, projects. Uh, first off, I worked for a non-governmental organization um, that, um, that um, sprung up projects that were sponsored by the US, Dutch, and Nigerian governments. So one of such exciting projects was one which was um, put up to alleviate subsistence farming and improve the lives of farmers. So we would travel around the country with our GPS devices and take uh, GPS coordinates um, record them, in, and then I would migrate these data into the databases, clean the data, normalize the data, standardize it, and get it ready for reporting. And um, one of the most exciting things about that job was the fact that I got to learn how to make maps. It was so exciting. And I was given this big book on map, um, map making, and in two weeks, I was able to create my first usable map. Um, and one of my maps, which was actually this one you see right here, was the one that was publicized in one of the monthly newsletters um, by the government, sponsored governments. So this map is about the nitrogen distribution around Nigeria in the soil, and it really helps the governments ascertain what kind of fertilizer to send to different parts of Nigeria to the farmers so they could grow more um, um, commercial-based cro um, crops. So it was pretty helpful. And then after that job, I joined another state government um, uh, project, which had to do with digitizing the land administration system. So in that job as an ITC cons ICT consultant, I, I, I put on many hats. I recommended sourced and configured hardware and software. I taught the government staff how to use Microsoft Office um, um, prod, uh, programs such as Word, PowerPoint, Excel. I picked up a couple of other um, software skills on the way as well. Worked with, a, worked with a great team of consultants as well. But something else I did in that job was to create a, a file tracking software for the land ownership files. So those land ownership files were prim primarily paper-based. So the data entry staff were able to, to enter the information via the land tracking software I created, save it in the database and retrieve it whenever someone came over to claim that they, they were the owner of a piece of land. So that was a pretty great um, application to prove the ownership of land. And then after that consultancy uh, job, I moved on to another exciting role. And this was um, pertained to um, building a very comprehensive web portal for all West African countries. So the 15 West African states. These pro this project was sponsored by European, North American, and um, governments as well as civil society organizations. So I built and hosted a user-friendly web portal which governments and um, organizations could, could get a breakdown of the funding that other governments had committed to very important initiatives that were going on around West Africa. So this was a pretty critical and important port portal that could really access in a user-friendly manner. And I also translated it from English to French. So I was able to use my skills to do so. It was an exciting project. And then um, I fell in love with an Australian, an amazing Australian guy, and we moved to Australia together. Um, he was based in Canberra because he worked for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He was a diplomat. Um, we, we, we were based in Canberra to start with. Um, and then I settled down, we settled down and we traveled around Australia to start. But then once I settled down, I was trying to Got, get all the paperwork so, sorted. Um, and um, while I was waiting for, for all, all the paperwork to get sorted and all, I decided to take a course um, at Stanford University on project management mastery. So it was three month intensive course. Um, and it was really, um, it was really fulfilling. I was happy I did so. But um, looking for, as a, as a new migrant in, in Canberra, and looking for an IT job was very challenging because obviously you would be handling personal and sensitive data by the government. So it was very challenging to find a job there. So I found the job much easier in Sydney and my, par my partner at the time and I decided that Sydney would be probably where I should um, reside to work. And then eventually I did move to Melbourne as well. 
but I'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's why I went to Sydney. And then in Sydney, um, I joined an amazing company that had just set up an IT services wing. So I was the first and only technical big BA supporting about 60 other engineers and other staff in there. So that company had set up an IT, managed IT services um, um, section to the company to the organization and there were seven upgrades behind in the main software that they were working with so i spent a fair few weekends try to upgrade and get them back to to speed on that i attained seven upgrades in a three months in the space of three months which is half of the time that it was anticipated that it would be done so i was pretty um, happy that i could get the business back to speed on the software updates and in the same job, um, there was the new ERP system, which I'd upgraded, was pretty new. So no one really knew much about it. So I, I learned it intently and I became the, the, um, the subject matter expert at it. So this was the system which, uh, into which other systems were integrated. So I managed the configurations, created configurations, workflows, triggers. Um, I, I created monitoring alerts. So for example, if a server should go down somewhere because of the integration into this system, an alert would automatically um, be created and our, our service technicians and our systems engineers and network engineers would get that alert on their phones or emails and quickly go fix the problem. So this was that central system that I managed as well. So I was the go-to person for, for um, configurations. And then on the same job in Sydney, they also had a six month backlog in reporting. So because they had a, a, a huge requirement to get this sorted, I hired an additional technical business analyst. And together we created very useful reports for the business as well as dashboards for the systems engineers as well and the business as well. So that's all in the same job in Sydney, which was really exciting. And I was so happy to have been building my experience in that, in that field. And the last exciting project I worked on in that job was to build a, a, an integration layer, so an API layer through which all the systems or most of the systems in the business was integrated. The reason why we did that was because we wanted to unify and standardize our reporting um, after that, because we have different, different formats to reporting. So we wanted to standardize our reporting. So the systems integration project was a big one. It was company-wide. And for my department, I got to create a, a, a fair, a fair um, number of APIs to integrate into that layer so that our, our reporting could be unified and standardized. I got to liaise with so many people around the business. It was an amazing experience. And then I, I wanted a bit of career progression from that, and I got an offer to move to Melbourne for um, um, a management role. And with that role, I managed companies, I mean, I managed teams onshore and offshore. And I got to get involved in the world of agile, where I supported the teams and managed them in a different way by enabling them and empowering them to do their work. So every two weeks when the teams produce their work, I would take that work to the clients, present the work, come back with feedback, share it with the team and we would continue to improve that way. And then I got um, another job, which was more project management related um, on, 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 that, on that end. And that job had to do with, it's, these are all contracts I took up by the way. So they were short term and time bound. Um, this one had to do with revamping the, the organization's internet and intranet internally. So the intranet is internal, the internet side of things was external. And my role was to make sure that the developers that built the internet and internet uh, did so with quality, on time, um, to budget, minimizing the risks as an IT project manager. And also similarly, in another job, there was a major migration project that we had to do from an older shared hosting server to a newer version of it. My, my task was to manage that as an IT project manager as well. And then just quickly, what I do right now is um, I'm a systems engineering manager, like Adam said, at NBN, and I manage teams of awesome engineers. And since my teams are distributed, I rely on strong partnerships with our talent suppliers to ensure that our teams stay engaged. Uh, we promote psychological safety together and, and, and ensure that there is quality de delivery regardless of where they are around the world. 
And I also lean in to support my teams and ensure that they do um, try to deliver with best practice and using industry standards as well, because we work on critical projects for Australia. Um, and ultimately, I support my team and, and wear different hats as required as a coach, as a facilitator, but ultimately I try to keep my teams focused on our vision, our values, and our purpose. So that is me in a nutshell. I have some other um, passions that I'm exploring on the side. I won't talk too much about it right now, but it's around blockchain technology, like our CIO spoke about, Debbie Taylor. I'm obsessed about the power of blockchain and how we can empower people. That is why I love blockchain so much. And obviously technology, technological ethics as well, because I wanna make sure that I'm on the good side of technology and, 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 and make sure I'm using it to empower lives and not to harm lives. And cybersecurity goes hand in hand with innovation. So I'm also quite interested in that. So that is my STEM journey so far. And I just wanna leave you with one motivating quote that powers me and that is, you are the designer of your destiny. You are the author of your story. So choose your own career adventure. Thank you very much. I'll take a cut question or two if we have time, Adam. Hey, Tiffany, that was such an impressive story. Thanks so much. We do have time for one quick question. This is kind of cool because you mentioned, you know, you know five languages, you're multilingual, and someone's asked, do you think being multilingual has helped you understand coding better? Oh, wow, that is a great question. You know what? I think so. Uh, because once when I picked up several languages and I grew up speaking several languages, I had a different way of thinking and associating words with objects in my head to actually pick it up and retain that knowledge a bit more. And I saw programming to be quite, quite similar uh, in, in, in the way in which I associated certain functionality with um, the way that objects work. So I think there was a link between it and there was a transferable skill from the languages I speak to the languages I coded in. So yes, I think there was a link there and then it really helped me. Nice. Thank you so much. Loved hearing your story. Uh, and for everyone listening in, that was the second of our four B sessions. Our third session we'll move into now. And the theme of this session is Be Brave. And sharing her story is Jen Beer. Jen is the Head of Health and Education for Regional and Remote at NBN. Jen's role focuses on the development implementation of regional and remote health and education strategies for NBN in partnership with key stakeholders across both those industries. And prior to MBN, Jen has enjoyed a, a pretty wide range of experiences as well, including her time as a vet and playing international volleyball. Can't wait to hear from you, Jen. Great, thank you, Adam. Hi, everyone. So brave, what comes to your mind when you hear the word brave? Is it something like this or this? Or this? Or this? Or for those Disney fans amongst you, of which I'm absolutely one, is it this? But how many of you thought of this? Or this? Hi everyone, um, my name is Dr. Jen Beer and I have the privilege to speak to you today about being brave in the career choices that you make. And for me, this image of a fork in the road really resonates because when I think about being brave, I think about the courage you need to make choices throughout your career journey that are sometimes, put simply, pretty damn scary. And whether it's the choices that you have to make at school, choices at uni, choices at TAFE or choices about where you work, when you want to know or when you know that they could have an impact on where your career path leads, they're usually not easy. So today I wanted to share with you three tools that have helped me throughout my career when I've needed to make some really difficult decisions. But first, I'll give you a quick whirlwind tour of my career to date. So as Adam mentioned, my career has had a lot of twists and turns. When I was growing up, it was my childhood dream to be a vet. My poor family pets were patients time and time again, and they would wait patiently in my pretend consulting room while I treated their pretend injuries and illnesses. And my dream came true. 
After five years at uni, I became a small animal vet surgeon in Perth. But beyond my vet career, I had a career in the not-for-profit sector, working with communities across WA, South Australia and Northern Territory, followed by a career at a large corporate as part of a scholarship to study a business degree. And finally, my current role at MBN that supports those living in some of Australia's most remote areas to get access to health services and education. And outside of work, I've also had the great privilege to represent Australia for indoor volleyball and have recently joined the board of Zoos Victoria that looks after Melbourne Zoo, Hillsville Sanctuary and Werribee Open Range Zoo to help them deliver their strategy that I'm really passionate about to fight extinction and create a future rich in wildlife. And while on paper, it may seem like a really strange career path, I've found that many of the decisions I've made or roles that I've been drawn towards have been the ones that allow me to help others, be it animals or humans, and to really make a difference in some way. And what I hope my career story highlights is that a career in STEM, which for me started with a vet science degree, doesn't need to be linear and can really take you so many different places. A career in STEM gives you the core skills that you need um, that are also applicable um, to a lot of different roles and industries. And the opportunities are really only limited um, by your imagination. But as exciting and na um, as navigating this winding path may seem, at times it isn't easy. So let me share with you three tools that I've used across my career. The first focuses on helping you figure out if an option is right for you right now, right for you but not right now, or not right for you. The second is about learning from others. And the third helps you think about the consequences of making certain decisions and also putting the decision in perspective. So this first tool helps you start by getting clear on the direction that you want to head in your career and then use this um, direction as a guide to assess the options in front of you. And when I say direction, it doesn't mean that you need to know exactly where you, what you want to do or where you want to be in five years, 10 years, even 30 years time. But what it does provide you with is a view of the types of things you want to be doing or conversely not doing. So in helping figure out the direction you want to head in, you can ask yourself some pretty simple questions. What do I like doing and want to do more of? What do I not like doing and want to do less of? What am I good at? What do I want to get better at? And what do I want to learn more about? Your answers to these questions give you a basis to assess the options in front of you and help you figure out, as I said, if the option is right for you now, which is the green light, if the option is right for you, but just not right now, which is the amber light, or the option that perhaps isn't right for you, which is the red light. And if I draw an example from my career, when I was working at a small not-for-profit in Perth, I knew that I wanted to develop my skills and knowledge in business, because as part of the vet degree, you get about four hours worth of business um, business training and they basically just say get a practice manager because you're great vets but not great at business. And so I was presented with an opportunity to study a business degree in Melbourne as part of a two-year internship scholarship where alongside the study I was employed by a large corporate organisation. I was nervous because it meant packing up my life in Perth moving to Melbourne, um, going from an organisation of five people to one of over 25,000 people, and also working in the telecommunications industry, which was very different from anything that I'd ever done previously. So I asked myself the questions above. What do I like doing and want to do more of? I enjoyed learning, and I knew that I wanted to learn more about business. I also wanted to put what I'd learnt into practice 
in a large, successful corporate setting. I knew that I was pretty good at building relationships, um, being part of a team and learning new things quickly. And outside of work, I knew that I loved watching sport and music. So I then assessed the option of moving to Melbourne and figured out that the opportunity was getting me closer to where I wanted to be. So I gave it the green light and two months later, I was on the plane to Melbourne. A couple of important takeaways with this tool. One, having that amber light or the option for not right now. Just because an option doesn't align where you are at at this particular point in time doesn't mean that it won't ever be right for you. Two, you can use this at any stage in your career, and I still use it with the choices that I need to make today. And three, you don't need to know your end destination. The important part is about knowing the direction that you want to travel in. And once you know this, the rest tends to take care of itself. So the second tool is about reaching out to people um, who have experience in the area that you're interested in. And there is often no better way of finding out what a profession or a course is really like than asking those who currently do it or have done it in the past. You can speak to family, friends, teachers or others who can give you advice about some of the um, decisions that they made or the things that they did to get them where they are today. They can also share some of the things um, that they thought about or were worried about as they navigated their decision. One word of caution with this tool though, is looking out for biases, which you may have heard of. And that's where someone may provide a skewed opinion based on their previous experience um, or experiences of people that they know. And so it's often important to really think carefully about who you ask and actually get some help from um, family or teachers in selecting the right people you wanna to speak to. And throughout my career, before thinking about joining a new organisation or company, I do my homework. I reach out to people I know who work there or who have worked there in the past. And I ask them some really simple questions. Do they enjoy it? What are the things that they find so enjoyable? What about, um, what about things that surprise them? And what is the culture like? And then this can also include when you change jobs within the same company. So in a previous company that I worked in, um, a new role came up in the product and technology space. And this was an area that I was really interested in, but I wanted to make sure that the role was right for me. So I asked people the questions about, you know, what the culture is really like on the ground and the most challenging things about the role. Um, and um, a lot of the people that I spoke to confirmed um, what I thought the product and technology space um, was about. And so I did feel that that move was right for me. So the key for this tool or the key takeaway for this tool is to do your homework. And you'll find that most people will be more than happy to share their insights with you if you show an interest in learning more. Just make sure you get a few different opinions because you want to make sure that you have a balanced view. And the last tool um, is something that I learned from a very wise and very special woman in my life who was 94 years old at the time. I remember speaking to her about a job I was thinking about taking and I was so nervous about making the wrong decision. And as she listened and heard me weigh up this option with that option, I was, and, and the fear that I had about making the wrong decision, she said to me, Jen, what is the worst that can happen? And then I started going through all of the things that could possibly go wrong. And she again listened patiently until I'd finished talking about the fourth or fifth potential downfall. And she said, okay, and what is the chance of that happening? And it was at that time 
that I realised what I was worried about um, really wasn't that likely to happen and that I'd been putting all my energy into why the move wouldn't work and not really giving any consideration to, well, things actually turning out for the better. So an example from my career, I remember when I chose to leave being a vet and moving into the not-for-profit space. Um, I had a number of people saying to me, what a waste of a degree, and are you really sure that this is the right thing to do? And it was a really difficult decision to make because I enjoyed being a vet, but I wanted to be able to shift my passion from helping animals to helping people. So I asked myself, what's the worst that can happen? And my answer was, the worst thing that can happen is that I really don't enjoy the work that I do and I miss being a vet. And in the event of that happening, I'll just go back to being a vet. And when I asked myself, what's the chance of that happening? I didn't think it would be high because I knew that I had a profession to fall back on and I knew that my backup plan was pretty sound. So this tool is all about putting the decision into perspective. So when you are making your decisions and consider the worst thing that can happen, if it's really not too bad, or if the chance of it happening is really low and it aligns with the direction that you want to head, then why not give it a go? So thank you again for letting me share my story today and some of the tools that have helped me throughout my career journey. Making brave career choices is at times really daunting. And to be honest, it's unlikely to ever be easy. But hopefully you can use some of the tools that I've shared today in helping you make these decisions. Think about the direction you wanna head and assess the options in front of you and determine if they're right for you right now, right for you but not right now, or not right for you. Get some insider knowledge to help you make your decision. And lastly, put your decision in perspective. What really is the worst that can happen? And one of the most important things to remember is everyone has their own career journey. It takes courage to take the path that isn't necessarily the easiest or the most travelled. And the great thing about choosing STEM as a career pathway is the amount of choice that you have and the different paths that you can take. And when you're a lot older, like me, I hope you get the opportunity to sit back and reflect on the decisions that you've made across your career. And I hope that you too get to share some of the knowledge and insights with students who are in your position right now, ready to embark on the first stages of their career and starting to make those decisions that will shape it. So good luck with your future choices. Be bold, be brave, and back your decisions as you forge your own path. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. And I think um, your, your topic was so relevant because a lot of people are asking around, you know, how do I choose the right course at university or even my school subject choices? Um, you covered a lot of that with some of the tools, but just quickly, um, maybe let's frame it this way. Like what, what do you think could be the worst that could happen for a young person if they happen to choose the wrong subject or the wrong course? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's, um, it's often thinking about what you can take out of that course as well. So obviously there are processes if you do need to um, change courses within um, university, but I think the most important part is also um, doing your preparation before you make the decision and also thinking about, um, you know, once you're in that course, I think there are a lot of um, courses that have the opportunity to move in different directions. Um, also, when you're reflecting on the decision that you've made, sometimes when you have a bad day or you might have uh, a difficult subject, you can often think, oh, I've made the wrong decision. And so I think it's really important to reflect over a period of time about why you feel that that decision may not be right for you. So has your situation changed or do you have new interests as something else has come to light? So I think um, taking the time to reflect on why you feel it's not right for you, um, ask for 
advice from the universities um, if there is a particular course that you're looking to get um, into. Um, and also um, speak to your family and friends about it as well, because sometimes talking about it um, can really help um, you identify in your mind about where you want to head. Thank you so much, Jen. That was uh, so interesting and, and really gave us some tangible tools to use as well. So, so thank you. Uh, folks, we're going to move on to our fourth and final B session now. Just to let you know, we're running about five minutes over time. So stick with us because uh, up next, the theme is be entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial and joining us is Ali Watson. So Ali is Scottish born. She's now a Melbourne based CEO and founder of Code Like a Girl, which is an award winning social enterprise that empowers and supports women and girls to enter and flourish in the world of tech as a vocal champion for change in you know, what has traditionally been a male dominated uh, sector. So Ali brings her years of experience as a software engineer to inspire and educate more young women to join the industry, one piece of code at a time. Over to you, Ali. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much, Adam. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, before I begin, I'd just love to acknowledge the lands in which I'm broadcasting from, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So Adam did a really great job of introducing myself and my organisation. It's Code Like a Ghetto, um, and we empower and enable women and ghettos to be equal creators in building the future. Because the technology that we build today really does determine the world that we live in tomorrow. And I believe that women and men's needs, whether that's our health needs, our professional needs, our safety, our family lives, our recreational needs, they're so uniquely different um, that if technology isn't built by teams and led by teams of equal representation with a vested interest in those unique needs, then our experience of our world, women's experience of our world will continue to be negatively impacted. But today I'm here to talk about my own career, how I came to found Code Like a Girl, um, how I went from technologist to entrepreneur. Um, but actually, my, my previous life before starting Code Like a Girl, I actually um, spent eight years working as a software engineer, as Adam said. Um, I worked mostly in web development, so working on websites as a back end engineer. Um, and I still dabble to this day in the code and the tech products that we've built for code like a girl, but I didn't always want to be a technologist. So my story actually starts back in my teenage years. So I'm going to totally give away my age now. I'm in my early thirties. Um, so I'm a millennial. <laughs> I grew up in the nineties when gender stereotypes were still very prevalent. Um, it didn't help that I grew up in a house full of women. So my mum, she was a single mom. I have three big sisters all, all back, back in Scotland. So miss them lots at the moment. Um, but my childhood was, you know, Spice Girls, Barbie dolls, very, very standard um, for a girl of those times. And from a young age, when I was at school, when I was your age, I wanted to be the next Frida Kahlo. So if you don't know who she is, she's a little picture of her on screen. She's an artist and I was the same. I loved expressing myself through arts and crafts. And I actually left school a year early to pursue my dream to get into art school. So Scotland, for those that don't know, is, is home to one of the most prestigious art schools in the world, the Rennie McIntosh Art School. So that was that was my dream. That's where I was gonna go. That's That was my identity, you know, the artist. But unfortunately, I got rejected from every art school in the country and not just one year, but I didn't give up. I, I tried again and that second year, I got rejected again. So I've been in that place where all your hopes and dreams, you put in one basket and the basket falls apart and panic really did start to set in. Um, and I had a lot of pressure from my parents. I'd done really well at school, got top grades in my family. So they couldn't quite <laughs> match the, the dream with um, with my, 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 my grades at school. So I think they were very much like, Ali, why are you not going to study medicine or something very academic? Um, but for me, I, I didn't want to do that, but it was very late in the day. So this was maybe like a month before university semester would start. And it was too late to apply for university. I'd missed, I'd missed the um, the application dates, but luckily there was this period called clearing, 
And clearing is, an, is a time of the year where there's leftover spots in courses, so still accepting late applications. And on this very short list of courses that had still spots left was computer science and software engineering. So at the time, I'd never done computing at my school. They didn't actually offer computing at my school. Um, and the only experience I'd had with programming, now this is probably showing my age, but there was this platform called MySpace. It's pretty much like the, the modern day Facebook, but with a bit of music. <laughs> and um, you could customize your profile using code. And so this was what my only exposure at the time to code was. And I, I think it gave me a false sense of uh, confidence that I could probably do a computer science degree. <laughs> so I signed up, I got accepted and I started my degree. And I couldn't believe it. The first day that I walked into my computer science class, there was the sea of men. Um, I, I didn't realize it would be so male dominated. And the the little gif on the screen at the moment is, um, is from one of my favorite movies, actually. It's Legally Blonde. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, it's about this Reese Witherspoon's in it and she goes to Harvard Law School and you know, everybody in the class doesn't really think she fits in. She, they, they're, they're like, are you supposed to be here? And I really was inspired by this movie. I felt very much like this protagonist, this main character in this story. Um, I'm really not embarrassed to say that it was, it was quite an inspiring movie for me. Um, but as the course started, I realized that it was such a, a, a steep learning curve um, for someone who one minute was being rejected from art school to the next studying the science of computers and software engineering. It was quite a stark contrast um, and I wasn't like anyone in the class. Everyone seemed to have um, a bit of knowledge within computers and, and coding already, whereas I was kind of the arty kid who had just uh, thought she'd give it a go. But um, I think what made it worse for me at the time and quite a difficult um, time for me was that I would feel quite insecure about my gender. Um, you know, I didn't really have the insight and knowledge that I have today as an adult. Um, I didn't realize that there were stereotypes that I was being exposed to. Um, and so sometimes I would succumb to these really toxic thoughts about, you know, I'm not getting this. Maybe there's a reason that there's more men in this classroom. Maybe there's a reason that women don't do this topic or, or subject that much. Um, maybe it's like hardwired in our DNA. So these were the really, really toxic thoughts that I was thinking of um, at the time. And I was thinking I should probably drop out. This is not, this is too hard. Um, and everywhere I looked, you know, there was men, <laughs> men on the cover of Wired magazine. The lecturers were men, the book authors were men, the tutors were men. And so I was battling with this constant um, imposter syndrome, they call it, where, you know, you don't feel like your successes are real. <laughs> like anytime you do something good, it's like, oh, that must have been a fluke. Um, but then I realized, you know, it, it's not always been this way in computing. Programming jobs in the really, really early days were actually dominated by women. Um, and men mostly worked in the hardware, whereas women worked in the software um, because it was kind of seen at the time in those early days as more administrative work. Um, but as the tech industry began to boom, innovation was happening. It was really growing. They needed more people and jobs. Um, so this was like early 50s. They started doing research on what makes a good programmer. And so the outcome was this <laughs> job ads recruitment calls, all targeting men. And so this was the 60s. I think they de definitely had misconceptions around what m women were good at, what men were good at, really old, outdated, traditional thinking of like men like objects and log logic. Women just love ga like chatting and gossiping. <laughs> they like people. So all these really outdated misconceptions had led to this outcome of yeah, men are, men are really made for computers. Um, and so that's why we have decades of historical innovations that have been led by men and women haven't really been a big, big um, contributor in the world of, of tech um, and the grand scheme of things because the messaging and the marketing really excluded them. Um, and so once I realized this, and once I sort of looked and reflected on my own childhood, I thought, wow, the Spice Girls and Barbies really betrayed me. <laughs> The marketing and the magazines I grew up with really didn't encourage me or 
conditioned me to consider technology. Yes, it was a total accident I was there, um, you know, but I didn't have any guiding light. All my mums and my aunties and every woman I knew, you know, they weren't in careers of technology or STEM. They were, they were very much in traditional gendered careers for women. And so once I kind of realised that, okay, this isn't DNA, this isn't hardwired, this isn't something that women just aren't naturally better at. It's actually just something we haven't been exposed to. And I'm starting late. So if there's any um, X-File fans in the audience, I feel like, again, <laughs> choose your audience, Ali. It's maybe a, a, a younger audience today. But for those that do remember, this was a, a very popular 90s TV program, The X-Files. And there's quite a phenomenon where um, there was a spike in women applying for STEM degrees because this really cool um, detective came from a STEM background. Um, and this is called the Scully effect. So I realized, you know, that all these influences, they, they don't sound important. They don't sound like how could a TV program change the amount of women entering science and technology. But actually, these things actually do really matter. When it comes to our identity, how we see ourselves and how we see our futures, um, pop culture does does influence us um, as women and as girls and as young people. So once I started to figure all this out, you know, that, that it wasn't DNA, it wasn't hardwired, that I was coming late to the table, coming late to these skill sets, everything started to click. And I was really enjoying the course. It was difficult, it was challenging, but I mean, I think a lot of things that are good are challenging and um, the sense of achievement I was getting from learning to code um, really, really was pushing me and motivating me further. So the most damaging phrase in the language, it's always been done that way. The second most important thing I learned when I was at university was that I was different and that was my strengths. My art and my design and my love for creating experiences for people using the design of technology and the building of software um, was my strength. There was no one really like me in the class that came from that design and art background. And suddenly I was starting to see things a little bit differently in my, my projects and my outcomes at university were always um, really driven by my own personal passions for art and design. And so fast forward, I, I completed my degree. I loved my degree. It was the best experience of my life, meeting all the different people in my class, being outside my comfort zone. I grew so much in such a short space of time and learned incredible skills um, like coding and computer science. But when I changed in, in countries, uh, seven years ago, um, I was working as a software engineer and what didn't change was the number of women in the industry. So it was very reflective of my class in computer science. I was one of 10 women in a class of like 200. Um, and similarly, when I was going for jobs, I was sometimes the, the only woman on the team, sometimes the first woman they'd ever hired. And even moving countries to Australia, that was that was a similar experience. So. I wanted to do something about it. Um, and so that's where I got the idea from for Code Like a Girl. I thought, what if I can inspire more girls to have visible role models? What if we could do the Scully effect where we put a bunch of these amazing women in front of young girls and teach them how to code and share with them our experiences of the industry um, and really change their opinions about technology and coding and show them the power of it. Um, so that's what we've been doing over the last six years with my business. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about what it's like to be a day in the life of an entrepreneur. So I've been doing this full time now for four years. Um, I've really, really loved it, really enjoyed it. I've been very lucky in some of the experiences I've had. Um, I've been on the side of a tram. <laughs> so that was real. <laughs> that happened once. <laughs> Um, my big face on the side of a tram. Um, what else have I done? I've done un influencer work. So um, I've worked with big brands and been able to do some cool things with um, big technology brands. Um, I've been to some really fun events. So again, networking is a big deal when you're trying to build a business, trying to grow your networks, um, going along to events and um, getting yourself out there is really important. I've been involved in, in a lot of great collaborations. So this was a, a collaboration with Facebook once where we created a documentary. Um, 
I've been interviewed a lot by journalists. So this was an, another new new life of the entrepreneur was speaking with journalists and being in magazines and getting asked a lot of questions, some very personal, some not so much. <laughs> um, but learning to be able to sort of do that and be comfortable and brave when it comes to um, telling your story and um, yeah, sharing with others about your journey. Um, this one time I just passed my driving test <laughs> and Mercedes-Benz gave me one of their smartest technology cars to drive. Brand new Mercedes-Benz. I was terrified. Um, they wanted me to drive it, test drive it and comment on the technology. Um, I did tell them I only just passed my driving test four weeks ago and <laughs> do I need to sign some disclaimer <laughs> in case I crash it. Um, so it's been a really versatile um, last four years. I think being an entrepreneur every day is, is very different um, one thing I would say is that my technology skills have been so amazing in, in terms of getting my idea off the ground so if you are thinking like an entrepreneurial career is for you um, I think technology enables you to have ideas and make those ideas come to life I meet lots of entrepreneurs who face barriers because you know I've got this amazing idea Ali I want to change the world Ali but I need a technologist to build me an app. I need a technologist to build me a website. And when you have those skills yourself, there's no barrier. There's no, I need funding to build this. It's kind of like build it, build an MVP, a minimal viable product, do it yourself. And so I think what I've really enjoyed is, is having that technology background and coming to the world of entrepreneurship and just having that freedom to try things and build things and and just get going. So um, they do say that there's more successful CEOs coming from an engineer background than they do from a business background. So it's certainly a very transferable skill set. Um, and I really thoroughly, given the name of my business, really thoroughly um, encourage all girls to, to gain coding skills. It may not be something that you choose to do at university. Maybe it's something you do on the side of your other degrees. We are so, so in need of women coming to this field. Um, the world of technology misses women's insights and knowledge deeply because there are blind spots and we're just seeing that happen, particularly with machine learning and artificial intelligence. When you have machine values built by human values and those humans don't represent our society, that's when the world goes wrong. So um, I can't tell you enough how much the tech industry wants more girls. Um, so certainly here for any questions you have about tech, um, you should definitely check out our website. Um, if you've got a parent who wants to sign up to one of our coding courses, go for it. They're, they're on codelikeagirl.com. So I've been Ali and this has been Be Entrepreneurial. So I hope, um, I hope you've enjoyed my talk. Thanks, Ali. Uh, that was so good. And as a fellow millennial, all those 90s <laughs> pop culture references uh, were great. I'm so glad they weren't lost. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, we, we will need to move on because we're going to wrap up. But um, I'll just remind the folk that they can uh, head direct, directly to your website and, and potentially reach out if they had any follow-up questions for you. Um, Thanks, Adam. No worries. So we'll wrap up now. That brings us to an end of our Be Inspired sessions and also brings us to the end of the event. A massive thank you to all of our speakers. We had Debbie kick off today by sharing her insights. Then we moved to our Q&A with our career panelists who were a, like a really impressive group of people at all different stages of their careers. And then of course, we just fin finished with our four Be Inspired sessions where we got to hear some powerful ideas from each of our speakers. So thank you to everyone who's joined us today and, and thank you for all of your great questions. Um, look, if you do have any further questions or some feedback, you'll see an email address on screen now. So feel welcome to send those through and we'll endeavor to come back to you. And just a closing thought that uh, as you kind of continue to think about job choices or school or university choices, uh, alter alternative career pathways and all those sorts of things, think back to some of these stories and messages and tools you've heard here today and they may give you some guidance. We really hope this day's inspired you to consider all the different career paths into science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics as it's an industry where you really can kind of choose your own adventure. Uh, and also remember that no matter which path you take, be authentic, be creative, be brave, and be entrepreneurial. Thank you. <laughs>